They are all indictable offenses with a maximum penalty of 14 years in prison. It's a very serious criminal offense. The worst part of this whole thing and the darkest moment that I had to endure, I think, was at the very beginning. They say the best things in life are free But you can give them to the birds and bees I need money That's what I want That's what I want That's what I want That's what I want Hi there, I'm Tom Nacho, and this is Fraud Squad TV. This series will introduce you to victims of fraud, allow you to hear from actual experts in the field, and provide you with tips and tricks so that you don't become a victim of fraud. Watch, look, listen, and learn, because it really can happen to you. And knowing it is your best defense. Come on, let's fight fraud together. Are you sure the money in your pocket is real? And would you be able to tell the difference? And if you did find a fake bill, what should you do with it? We're about to show you. Millions of dollars in counterfeit cash are on the streets of Canada today. The cost of security features and lost revenue are left to, you guessed it, us, the taxpayers. We'll also show you some amazing technological breakthroughs being made by the Bank of Canada to protect us from bogus bills. Take a look at this. For possession of counterfeit money, for making counterfeit money, for uttering or using counterfeit money, and for possessing instruments that are used to make counterfeit currency. They are all indictable offenses with a maximum penalty of 14 years imprisonment. It's a very serious criminal offense. Officer Barry Baxter has been instrumental in the fight against counterfeit money. Yet, even with stiff criminal sentences, there's still a lot of guys trying to pull it off. But as Baxter says, they're becoming less and less successful. As a result of the increases in counterfeit activity between the years 2001 and 2003, the Bank of Canada responded with the introduction of the new Canadian Journey series banknotes with state-of-the-art security features. Now, a counterfeiter can use existing technology in order to create the basics of a counterfeit banknote. However, the enhanced security features are very difficult to produce in a method that allows deception to retail merchants or the public. It's very easy for the average person to tell a real banknote from a fake one. Uh, it takes only a few minutes to learn, actually, and a few seconds to check. One security element is the holographic stripe that can be found right here on the left side of the banknote. What's to look for in it is the color shifting. When you move the banknote, it should be going through all of colors of the rainbow. Another feature is a security thread that is uh, found on the reverse side of the banknote in the left side. If you hold the banknote in front of a, uh, of a light source, what you'll see is that the dotted line becomes a full line that goes from the top of the bill to the bottom of it. Uh, security features such as the watermark in the center of the new $10 bills and that if you hold the uh, four uh, $10 the new bills that you can see that the four little rectangles form into a band. If a retail merchant or clerk uh, is engaged in a transaction where they are suspicious of a banknote, from a law enforcement perspective, we would like them to retain the banknote as long as it is safe to do so and not to put themselves in a position where they may come to bodily harm. They can refuse the transaction. 
However, again, we advocate to not place yourself in harm's way. If you are able to retain the note, you must contact local law enforcement immediately. This is a criminal activity. Uh, unfortunately, we are aware of some instances where people who have found themselves to be in possession of what they believe to be a counterfeit banknote, that they have engaged in the criminal activity of attempting to pass it on to somebody else, which simply is criminal in nature and further fuels organized crime activity. The Bank of Canada continues to develop processes which will fight against fraudulent money. In fact, they've got some new ones that are out almost any time now. But in the meantime, here's some tips that they've developed that will help you in the fight against fraudulent money. First of all, when you're checking a bill, always look for two or more security features and compare that bill to a bill that you know was genuine to make sure that you've got that comparison properly. Now, keep this in mind as well. The person passing the bill's integrity may not be in question, it just might be the bill. Lots of innocent people have counterfeit money in their hands or in their wallets. It is a crime to knowingly pass a counterfeit bill to someone who doesn't suspect it. Now, if you want more information on what the Bank of Canada is doing, you can visit their website. We're with Craig Hannaford again of Hannaford Partners Incorporated. After 25 years in the business, I imagine you've seen your fair share of counterfeits. Here's a scenario for you. 18-year-old kid working at a convenience store. Big tough guy comes in at 11 o'clock at night, tries to pass a 50. What we're told to do is to reject it. But in that scenario, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Well, that's, that's one of the things to keep in mind. You know, it's safety and security of employees first. We're not asking anybody to do anything that might jeopardize their safety. However, if the circumstance allows it, uh, I think you can identify to the customer that this appears to be a counterfeit and refuse to accept the note. Better still to get the customer to agree that you're going to call the authorities and turn it over to police. We've been talking about Canadian money. Canadian money has always been very colorful. The fives are blue, the tens are purple. You'd think it would be harder to counterfeit. Well, actually, uh, it is more difficult to counterfeit. And with a lot of the new security features that the Bank of Canada is putting into their currency, it makes it very difficult to counterfeit. But you know, counterfeiting won't end. There'll always be counterfeiters out there. So it is important to know your currency and know how to identify whether it's a counterfeit or not. So a few simple rules, and you'll make sure that the money in your wallet is actually real. Here's Craig with a few more tips. Take a look at the hologram on the note and move it back and forth. You should see a shift in color in the hologram. If you hold your bill up to the light, you will see various watermarks that are visible. Another thing that you can do is look at the security thread, which is found through the note. And when you hold that up to the light, it should become one solid line. Don't be stuck with a counterfeit note. If you are uncertain, simply refuse to accept it and suggest that it be turned over to the police. We'll be back in a moment with more Fraud Squad TV. Imagine this. You own your home outright, and you don't owe a dime on it. But one day, you get a call from the bank looking for your mortgage payment. What happened? Well, someone that you don't even know walked into the bank, assumed your identity, took your mortgage out on your home, and then left you responsible. The worst part of this whole thing and the darkest moment that I had to endure, I think, was at the very beginning when I didn't have an understanding of what had happened to me and why it happened to me. Back in 2005, I sold my house. I found a new residence to buy and went to my bank to arrange mortgage on the new property that I was about to purchase. Much to my surprise, when I went in to see Mary at the bank, she said, Sue, sit down. You don't own the house. You've been the victim of mortgage fraud. I know, but it happened. I'm sorry. That was only the beginning of Susan's nightmare. 
Not only did this so-called Mr. Wright get away with $300,000 scot-free, but the bank expected Susan to pay for it. Fraudsters are very organized. They know the process. They create fake identities. They create fake agreements of purchase and sale. They'll duplicate a regular real estate transaction with straw people, and then they'll just proceed as if it was real. I'd been receiving statements from Maple Trust to a Thomas Wright at my address. I opened it, and sure enough, it was a statement for a mortgage on my property to, almost, to the tune of almost $300,000. Susan's uh, first question to me, of course, was, well, this is ridiculous. They're asking me to be responsible for a mortgage I neither signed nor had anything to do with. And uh, it was very difficult, and I remember it well, her reaction when I told her that the problem was much worse than she thought. Not only could they evict her from her home, I had no defense to such an action if they chose to bring it. The law set a precedent that I've, I've fraudulent mortgage was valid, and that's why I was stuck trying to get my mortgage dismissed. It was scary, I gotta tell you, I was scared to death. So I came home late from curling one night, there's a knock at the door, I don't answer it, and uh, it's, getting, it's getting louder and louder and louder. Then he started shining this huge flashlight up the hall, and then I got really scared, so I called 911, and within five minutes, there were like five police cars here, but it turned out it was a sheriff who served me with papers for eviction for non-payment of this fraudulent mortgage that they put on. So up until this point, I'd been this nice guy. But the next day, we called the star. And that's when the star came in, did the story on me, and it was picked up and read by um, Joe Tascona, the MPP for Barry Simcoe. So with his help, we went and took on the Ontario government. The law seems to be on the side of the scumbag who defrauded Susan Lawrence. So Susan and her lawyer had to accomplish the seemingly impossible. They had to set new precedent, actually make new law. The case that, in fact, was the one that Susan's case overturned involved a woman who had forged her husband's name on a mortgage so she could take the money and go to a casino and gamble it all away. You could understand the court's reluctance to let her and her husband, who were not split up, walk away with uh, with that money, leaving the banks uh, defenseless in terms of their ability to recover. I was victimized twice. I was victimized in that they stole my house, and then I was victimized again. It was up to me to prove that these guys were bad and that my, my f the fraud had been committed against me. There wasn't an MPP in the province whose phone wasn't ringing off the hook from constituents asking them to explain how Ontario could have a law like this that actually put homeowners at risk for something they could not prevent or do anything about. So not only did she hire a lawyer at huge expense to herself, but she went public with it and she had the strength and the courage to actually go and try and convince the Ontario Court of Appeal to reverse itself after only five months. The new law, which changed the actual Land Titles Act in Ontario, and that in combination with the outcome of Susan Lawrence's case, uh, took the responsibility for resolving this problem off the shoulders of the innocent uh, victim. I'm pretty proud of what we accomplished. I don't think I understood how big a deal it was at first, but then when I read in the law magazines and on all the websites about the great job I've done, and I, I feel great. You've just heard a story about Susan Lawrence. Now, how do good guys go bad? This is a story about a man named Kevin Barnes. He was seduced by greed, and he fed that greed by leveraging other people's properties and their dreams. I received five years in Leavenworth, did five years in the halfway house. Prison's not fun. I mean, and no matter where you're at, a halfway house is not fun. Um, you don't forget the smells, you don't forget the noises, you don't forget the people. It's when everything's taken away from you and you survive or you're underneath somebody else, um, is control. Uh, just like, and I use this analogy, when somebody gets a speeding ticket or for a DUI or anything, they go sit in the county jail, multiply it times 100. 
I mean, it's simply like that. And just the noises and just the people, just it's not where you want to go. It's not where you want to be. We committed a mortgage fraud from the inside out. Uh, we started off making false statements on our standard 1003 form, the loan application, by coaching the consumer on what to do. Um, in turn, if that didn't work, we would then wait till the consumer was gone and then alter and change their documents for them. The way I benefited for this particular thing is by more cash in my pocket. It's all about money. So the more loans I could close and the more people I could get approved, the more money that I would make. 24 million was the actual loss. 100 million we got away with, which is 124 million dollars. The 100 million went defunct after the fact. So the total loss would have been 124 million. And it was over a five year period. In this particular case, I had found somebody who worked for the credit reporting agencies who could alter and change. She was in the data department, so she could change the credit reports. She loved to smoke dope. Um, she couldn't afford it. So we found that weak link, and we decided if we can supply that for you, would you take care of our credit reports? She in turn negotiated this, and we took care of her. She took care of us. I actually got caught up to by the RTC Resolution Trust Corporation. They started looking at the bad business decisions that these banks had made. And he realized that we never sent up a red flag. And in turn, that was a red flag to that auditor or that investigator. And so he took the files, all of them, and he went backwards through everything he'd ever touched and handed them to the FBI. And they, in turn, investigated. When I got out of prison in 97 and off parole, I set out to beat the system again. I simply went undercover myself and been hired by three of the largest banks as a convicted federal felon. I teach and train and educate the industry on mortgage fraud, on the red flags. I take the time to show them the proper way to take a 1003, to educate realtors, to deal with brokers and appraisers, all with integrity, so we all work together on the same format. Based upon the numbers that we see and what we deal with on a daily basis, we're looking at an $86 billion problem, that's with a B. If we're on the same platform and format, then we're gonna start taking this $86 billion problem and chipping away at it. Back with Craig Hannaford talking about mortgage fraud this time. Unbelievable, as despicable as it is, you've almost got to admire the fraudsters for coming up with that loophole. Who would have believed that you could take a mortgage on my house? Well, you know, it can happen and it has happened. It's probably a little bit more difficult these days because there's been a lot of awareness about it, but you still have to be vigilant. On the other hand, in the old days, you knew your banker, there's no way that you could go in posing as me because, you know, I'd made the deal with him. In this day and age of internet banking where people are doing things electronically, we've lost that human touch with our banker. So if they see something coming through the bank that doesn't sort of match with your profile, they'll probably call you, and that's a good way to protect yourself. Thanks, Craig Hannaford, for the information on that. And now Craig has got a few more tips. One of the best things is to check your credit rating at least once a year. This will show you if somebody has put a mortgage on your property that you're not aware of. And one of the other things that you can do is you can actually purchase insurance that will protect you against mortgage fraud. We'll be back in a moment with more Fraud Squad TV. Have you or anyone you've known been the victim of a fraud or a scam? Well, unfortunately, most of us have. And the length that fraudsters will go to get what they want might shock you. Millions of people will be the victims of identity theft this year. And in almost 70% of the cases, the information will be gained by stealing a wallet, mail, or unbelievably by someone the victim knew. In this segment, Fraud Squad TV takes it to the street to hear some of your stories. I had my credit card stolen, it never got to me in the mail, and then when I inquired about the missing card, apparently there was already a $4,500 charge on it, so someone took it from the mail before it got to my house. I applied for the credit card, I got my PIN number, never got the card, I waited, 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 finally called to ask where the card was because I'd received my PIN number. They kept asking me, you know, you should have received it, are you sure you didn't receive it? And I said, what's the problem? And uh, finally the guy said, well, there's already a $4,500 charge on the card. They basically accused me that I was trying to scam them, and eventually it was proven that I was innocent. But it was a huge hassle for me, and I had to do all the work to prove that, it wasn't a, that I wasn't the person that was doing the scam, that I had been scammed. So it was, it was pretty bad. So my buddy had an old Acura about 1992 and he's trying to sell it for about 1500 bucks. This guy in Ottawa calls him up and says I want to buy it. Come up to Ottawa, I'll give you a check and a Greyhound ticket and send you home. Anyways, my buddy does it, drives up to Ottawa, gets her in a bad check, 1500 bucks, 
buddy does not buy him a bus ticket, stuck in Ottawa, no car, no way home, had to hitchhike home. Anytime you're going to sell a car, you've got to get a certified check. There's just no other way to do it. Personal check is nothing, it's just paper. So certified check, that's, that's about the only way you can get around that situation. Always remember, keep your personal information safe. Don't ever leave your wallet or purse unattended, especially in public areas like grocery stores, restaurants, or even under your work desk. You never know who might be waiting for the opportunity to take it. This is Naomi Joy for Fraud Squad TV. Thanks for watching. Join us again next week for another episode of Fraud Squad TV. And remember, visit our website for more information on today's show or to learn about fraud or to tell us your story. Go to fraudsquadtv.com. Let's fight fraud together.